if there's a question you have, uh, if there is a question you have later on, you can feel free to DM me. You know, I, I keep my DMs open. Um, you can also email me at billy.carando at oracle.com. And of course, you can get a link to this presentation slide deck here at this link to my GitHub. So with that said, let's kind of go, well, I guess a little bit more uh, bureaucracy. Um, if you do leave with an intense desire to know more, the team I'm on at Oracle, we have a lot of great resources for continued learning about Java. Um, released last September, we published dev.java, which has a lot of tutorials and also a lot of links to Java usage groups like here with um, Cincinnati Jug and there's so many other jugs around. So if you want to get connected with these other Java usage group, um, there's a great place to go. Also a great way to maybe find out to reach out for if you want to get into presenting, um, that's a great place to do. That's actually how I got my start as a presenter was through my local Java usage group. Uh, we also have Inside Java, and so when Inside Java is is it gives a perspective from inside the Open JDK project of the engineers at Oracle and other places um, that are contributing to Open JDK. Um, you know the projects they're working on and, and new features coming out as well. So that's some really great information. Um, if you want to kind of get an idea of maybe what's coming in like JDK 19, 20, 21, and so on. Uh, we also have our YouTube channel uh, where we publish uh, both Inside Java podcast to there, along with any of your podcasts. We have the Inside Java newscast um, as well, and then the Jeff Cafe are all published there. Newscast covering you know new developments to JDK. Uh, Jeff Cafe that's by Jose Palmard, and he covers in depth um, various Java topics. And then I publish the Sip of Java every Monday. Well, almost every Monday. I did skip this Monday because again, uh, COVID. <laughs> so I just didn't have time to, to put that together this week, but I will be back to publishing again next week. And I do a one minute video on various Java topics. That said, bureaucracy and all that stuff out of the way, let's actually get into this presentation. So what the agenda will be is we're gonna first look at these new language features um, that again have come between 11 and 18. Um, then we'll look at some new runtime features. Then we'll get into some deprecation removals and some other important changes to know about. And then we'll look a little bit into the future of what's coming into the immediate new releases of Java, you know, in the near future. So new language features. Let's kick it off with text blocks. They were added in Java 15 and their JEP is 378. Now, JEP, if you're not familiar with that term, um, acronym, it is stands for JDK Enhancement Proposal. So whenever there's a somewhat significant change that's going to be done to the JDK, I think it's like it requires like two weeks of more development work or maybe something like that. It goes through the JDK enhancement process where um, it's proposed and Basically, what you can do is you can go here to openjdkjava.net jips zero. Come on. Whoops. There we go. So openjdkjava.net jips zero. And this gives you all the list of all the jips that have been done or even down here proposed as well. Um, and this number, like 378, if we were to go here to 378, whoops, it will give you like the summary, background, motivation, and all that behind uh, the feature that I'm covering. It can go into much more depth than you can really get into in this presentation, as obviously I'm covering quite a bit during this presentation. But there is a specific feature you want to know more about. Definitely check out this um, because it can give you a lot more good information about that feature. So anyways, add in Java 15, and it's JEPS 378. And so... JEPs are not JEPs, text blocks. What they are really great for is handling formatted code within a string within your code, which is something that certainly I know when I was still working as a Java developer, um, I've had to work with many times. Here in this example, I have like a very simple JSON message, but you know, XML, SQL, so many things I've had to work with where you know, you have to do this within like a one dimensional string. You have to add like all this formatting, escaping of quotes and all that stuff. And it's just a mess to look at. We, you know, we can probably pretty easily understand what's going on here. Um, but again, this is a very simple example. 
And that's also probably because there's somewhat experienced developers and we've probably done this a few times, but there's also, it can be really easy for bugs to happen. If this was like a more complex message where we had some nesting or we wanted to add new fields, it can be really easy to forget to add a comma at the end of a line or, you know, forget that there isn't a comma here or something like that. And then all of a sudden you have a bug in your code. Um, so luckily now we have text blocks, which are simply two dimensional strings. Text blocks are denoted by a triple quote, whoops, a triple quote, a new line, and an enclosing triple quote. Within here, within this area, formatting is reserved, and then also the need for escaping is significantly relaxed. So we don't need to escape new lines. This new line is reserved. We don't need to escape these, um, these single quotes or these single double quotes um, as well. So that way, this is what would the actual be, this is what would be actually rendered by the JVM if we were to print out this string pretty much exactly as is. Now, a big thing also is comes with incidental white space. So pretty much that is determined by where this enclosing triple quote is, more or less. There's a there's some rules around this. Uh, but basically keep your enclosing triple quotes aligned with wherever what white space you want preserved. So in here, in this case, I don't want to preserve any of this white space. I want this to be the most, the leftmost column here. So, um, you know, I, I aligned it then with these, these curly braces. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a bit of this around here, but basically just align these triple quotes with whatever you want the, le the leftmost columns to be. And then all this white space then would then be ignored. <clears throat> so, but text blocks, um, fundamentally, they are just normal strings um, as far as the compiler is concerned. So they can be treated like normal strings. Like here, if I just wanted to um, substitute values in and using formatting, that works just like it would just a normal one dimensional string that you know, you're used to. Uh, like I said, fundamentally, these are just normal strings. So any sort of um, string API works just as well on them as they would a, a one dimensional string. Now, if you did want to actually have like a, a longer line printed, or you just wanted to ignore a character turn on the very, as a very last character within that line, if you put a backslash, a backslash uh, that would then uh, tell the compiler to ignore that new line return. So if I was to print out this line, it would all be printed out as a single long line. But again, this has to be the last character, not the, um, the if I had like a, this, this backslash and then a space after it, then it would actually still, you know, print this out as a second line. So just make sure if you're doing that, that you don't have any um, white space characters after the backslash. One moment. All right, so the next item I wanna cover Regarding text blocks, any idea why it took 25 years to add? <laughs> um, so this kind of, well, I guess I can't say specifically why it took so long to do that, um, but why oftentimes Java seems a bit slower uh, to add a new features compared to other languages. Well, there's two reasons. One um, is that Java just has an enormous user base. And so we have to kind of keep, be somewhat conservative and keep that in mind that, you know, small changes to the Java, to Java will have very large impacts. The other is that is what Brian Getz calls, Brian Getz being the Java language architect calls the last mover advantage. And so sometimes Java does look at what other languages have implemented and, um, you know, make sure it sees like, okay, these are successful text blocks. Well, they have been a while for quite a while in some other languages, but I've obviously been very successful and very helpful. And so that was then integrated into Java. Um, you know, also things like Lambdas, you know, had also been implemented in other languages for languages for quite some time and before they were implemented java because we were looking at like oh okay that was pretty successful that's been widely used that stuff solves um important use cases so that will then be incorporated uh, into java um you know we can actually see the opposite of that where we take some ideas from other languages and it can actually be an issue here in just a moment with the switch updates so something that Java took from another language was fall through by default 
in a switch, we took that from like C and C++. And as a result, like the um, switch um, syntax that we're all familiar with as developers, unless you're already on 17 and using it, is this colon syntax where, you know, you write your case out, new line, then, you know, you execute whatever you want to execute, and then you have to do a break for each line. This makes not only switches visually very noisy, um, but it also makes them very prone to um, introduction of bugs because you could be working on this switch statement and then, you know, you maybe forget you take out one of the break statements or you do some sort of refactoring to where one of the break statements is no longer there. And now when it matches on case six, it falls through to case seven and, you know, you, you have a bug. So, yeah. <laughs> That was a perfect timing, Justin. I unintentionally was like a seated, but uh, but that's kind of why. So that's kind of like the last mover advantage maybe Brian was talking about to where you look, we look to see how other language features are being um, used in other languages, whether it's other JVM languages like Kotlin, Scala, Closer, and stuff like that, or even other languages outside Python, Perl, Ruby, um, that um, to see how successful and used they are before we're also bringing them in because there is a pretty significant cost when it comes to supporting new language features. Um, if a new language feature isn't working that well or um, you know, it's, it's really hard to roll that back out or change it, or really change it as often just not practical. Um, and then there's also just a cost in the maintenance cost of supporting that feature within the J JDK and the JVM. So, that's going to be why it can take a bit of time to do that. And certainly there have been switches, is one of those serialization. <laughs> you know, if there, if you've seen any presentations from uh, Brian Getz or Stuart Marks or many other um, people that are high up in the, uh, in the Java community, um, switch is kind of like one of those big regret regrets within Java uh, because it has a lot of issues with it and there's a huge um, support cost with it. So sometimes that's why it can be a little bit conservative and slow moving um, because big, big install base and we don't, you know, want to, we, we, we've been stung by that a few times so we don't want to uh, avoid being stung again. So anyways, to get back to uh, um, switch updates though, kind of already covered it. We, we were all kind of already know some of the pain involved with Switch, as I just covered. So, uh, and also the Switch updates, they were added in, JDK, in Java 14, um, and the JEP is referred to as Switch expressions, but I kind of changed this one up to Switch updates because it's more significant than just um, adding expressions, as I'll cover here in just a moment. So, what was added to Switch is this new arrow syntax, and the arrow syntax is, it will match on a case, and then only the code to the right of the arrow will be executed. Um, so that way we don't have to do a break statement, which makes this way less visually noisy and also way less um, prone to an inter um, introduction of bugs by accident because we don't have to remember to put a new break statement for every um, single case. So yeah, uh, but switches can be written are with the arrow syntax as statements, like in this case, in which this case, it doesn't need a default case in it, or they can also be written as expressions. Now, when they're written as expressions, they have to be exhaustive. So for right, right now, that almost always means there's gonna be a default case within your switch. Um, like we see here, where you know we have cases one through seven for every day of the week, and then a default case where I'm, in this case, throwing an exception. Um, so yeah, a case or expression needs to throw or return or yield a value or it needs to throw an exception. Um, also with the arrow syntax, you can also write them as a block if there is a case or all the cases or perhaps where you do have to have some more complex behavior happening that, that can be done in a single line. Um, and then if you're writing it as an expression, that case would need to also end with a yield or of course also a throw as well, if that makes sense. Yield, I can't remember, I keep forgetting to look up and it's, but the yield is not a keyword. It's um, only context sensitive to within a switch expression. Um, but so that way, if you do for some reason have yield somewhere else within your code base, that's not gonna cause an error. 
um, within it, it's not going to cause a compiler error because yield isn't a keyword. And the reason yield was chosen versus instead of return, is to not cause some sort of confusion where if you had this expression within a method, well, of course, you're always going to have to have it somewhere in a method. Um, it won't be confusing to say, okay, are we returning this outside of the method or is it returning it out of the switch? Um, so yield was used instead to make that distinction clear that you're yielding this value out of the switch expression. The colon syntax can also be written as an expression as well. And this is the equivalent example to what was before, basically, uh, where again, just yielding out these, um, the string values from it. Of course, also when you're doing an expression, all the types you're yielding out of each case have to be an appropriate type for what's being assigned here. So if I try to yield uh, an integer or something like that, that would give a compiler error. So I mentioned you'll often need a default um, case, but uh, here in this example, I'm switching over um, an enum. And in this case, I'm covering all the different values within that enum. And because of that, I don't need a default case. We'll see a little bit later on in the uh, beyond person where we're looking into the future, how um, there will be more examples of not needing a default case as which gets receives a few more updates in uh, future versions of Java. And yeah, here's an example also, colon syntax um, where I don't need a default case either. So pattern matching is going to become a very important um, story going forward within Java. And again, that will be something we'll cover a little bit further in the beyond portion. But the first instance of pattern matching is pattern matching for instance of. And that was added in Java 16. And that JEP is 394. So for instance of, uh, basically, we, you know, like we may have some sort of um, reference variable and, you know, where we just, for some reason, aren't sure of the specific type of it. And so then we have to do some sort of test, like, okay, is actually a string, it's actually an instance of string. And then within the if block, then we just need to create a new variable and then cast it. And then we do our work with that uh, variable. Again, pretty messy. And maybe this isn't the best example where I should maybe have multiple calls to this where, you know, maybe it's not, it's not a string, then maybe an integer, maybe a long to where we can maybe more see some of the issues with this setup. Um, but, you know, there, again, there's this opportunities for bugs if you kind of maybe mess up this assignment or something like that. Now, what we can do is um, do, you know, test to see is actually a string instance of a string. And if it is, then it will be assigned to now I'm a string. And this is what a pattern is. You have a predicate, you have a test here, actually a string instance of a string. And then you have a pattern variable, which is then assigned to what's called flow scope. What flow scope is, is that this is only in scope wherever the compiler knows this has definitely been assigned. So basically wherever the compiler knows the predicate has definitely been true, this is in scope. So a lot of times this is just going to mean in the subsequent if block to your instance of, um, this will be in scope. But again, to kind of maybe go into a little bit more of this flow scope, because it is somewhat of a new concept, at least for Java developers, um, here, you know, we have these two examples of um, pattern matching for instance of. Now I'm a string, of course, would be in scope, assuming this is true, and then it would be in scope in the following if block. But it would be out of scope the second we leave, leave this if block because, of course, the compiler wouldn't know if this was true because this could be executed with this still being false. Here, like in this evaluation, if I just did this, it would be out of scope. Now I'm assuming it would be out of scope once again the second I left this evaluation. Um, of course, also, that would mean that if I, uh, whoops. Oh, there we go. Um, if I try to do like actually I'm a string, now I'm a string, and then I did an R, well, of course, that would this wouldn't be in scope because the only way to get to the right side of this R is if this part was false. But of course, if I did uh, with an and, that would work because the only way to get to this and is if this was true. 
you can get pretty weird with this if you wanted to not that i would recommend it but like if i did like a knot in front of this then now my string would be in scope within the else but of course not the if block or if i did if and then not this and then did a throw then actually now my string would be in scope outside of the if block following this if statement don't do any of this. This is just to kind of show how this new flow scope works. And again, this would be kind of relevant because this is the first example of pattern matching, but there are going to be more examples later on as well. Yeah, but most of the time, what you're going to do is, is you're going to want to maybe have a um, variable at the appropriate scope for what you want it to be. You assign it then within that if, and then you know you kind of work with that uh, variable as as you need later on in your code. Sealed classes, um, these were added in Java 17 and their JEP is 409. <clears throat> so what sealed classes allow you to do, or at least the main benefit I see in sealed classes, is allow you to put uh, domain information into your code. Again, my time as a Java developer, working for several different organizations, every organization has certain domain concepts. And there could be things like transaction types, in this case, user, um, you know, and, and stuff like that to where you're going to have like maybe like a super type and there could be a certain um, limited number of subtypes of it. But before in Java, there was no real way of defining how that would look. You know, you could, it would have to be kind of communicated verbally or in documentation. Sealed classes actually allow that to be defined in code to where with a sealed hierarchy, you have a super class that can define which subclasses can extend off of it. In this case, I have a user is a sealed class and it says only guest, customer, and admin can extend off of it. Now, when you have that, those subclasses have to define themselves as either final, like in the case of guest, which is what this solid outline um, signifies, non-sealed, which effectively makes it a normal class, which is like this customer, which means then anything can extend off a customer because maybe we just have a lot of different customer types and we just don't want to necessarily create a sealed hierarchy for it yet or at all. Or also you can have another sealed hierarchy um, like in the case of admin, where we maybe have just two different types of admin. So what this looks like in code is when you're defining your class, you would say, use a new keyword sealed and then the class name. And then there's this optional permits clause where you say, okay, you define the classes that can then extend off of user. And then of course, as I said, these subclasses, admin, customer, and guest must be declared as either sealed, like it is with admin, final, like if it is guest, or non-sealed, like it is with customer. Um, as I mentioned, also permits is optional. Um, if I was, if all of these classes were in the same source file as user, then the compiler would assume that those are these only allowed subclasses for seal for user. And you would not need a permits clause in that case. Indeed, you would get a compiler error if you have other classes defined within the same source file as user and you try to put a permits clause within there. Um, the last new language, or the second to last new language feature I'll be talking about is records. And uh, records, I think, are one of the most important new features that have been added to Java since lambdas and streams in Java 8. Um, and there's something that can be continue to be built upon, again, also being the future, though I keep uh, um, foreshadowing towards the end of this presentation because there's also a bunch of new cool features coming later on as well. But they were added in Java 16 and their JEP is 395. So the first and most immediate benefit to uh, record is the reduction in verbosity. So I know this code is really small and hard to read. I deliberately made it so, but like imagine within a method, you're doing some sort of data transformation. Again, a task I remember uh, 
fondly uh, from my time as a Java developer, where maybe I have some sort of, you know, a number of fields that then I need to put into some sort of class or shape to kind of work with later on. But maybe this class would only really make sense within the context of this method. And so I, again, had this several times. And because how complex it is to write just even a simple class, because you need maybe like equals, has code, accessors, a, um, a, a constructor and all that, you know, it can quickly require dozens of lines and writing that out within a method uh, would be very distracting. So you would often have to write that out into a separate external class. With records, this can be defined within a single line. So basically everything that was in here, actually even more than what's in here, because this doesn't even have accessors, is all written within this single line. And this is possible because, um, so our records are supposed to be um, transparent modeling data of data. So it's not just about verbosity, but that's one of the main goals is to have a transparent modeling of data as data. So we can just look at the definition of a record and really get a full idea of what that record is all about. That, okay, the name of the, of the record and then all the fields that would be contained within the record. And this is possible because there are certain constraints placed upon records that their superclass is always going to be Java lane record. So they can't be extended abstract and as a result, they're implicitly final. Um, so that way they can't be inheriting some other additional behavior, fields, methods, or anything kind of like that. All the fields within a record are final, uh, but they're only shallowly immutable. So if one of those fields was like an array list, I could, of course, add or remove items from that array list, um, but I couldn't change it out with a reference to a different list. We also can't declare any instance fields. So again, I can't have some other fields like you can further extend these records are, you know, you can add like new methods and stuff to them, but I couldn't add a new instance field because again, that would break the ability just to read the definition of the record and know all about it. Um, but as also a result then, um, the compiler will automatically generate accessors. Now, in this case, the accessors are just using, uh, when you're defining a record, these are called components, which then become the, the fields of the class. Um, the accessors are just the name of the components. So if I wanted to get first name out of the person record, I would just do the instance name dot first name um, to get it. It wouldn't be using the Java beans getter to get set kind of um, uh, methodology. It just uses the, the name of the component itself. <clears throat> However, for all of these generated methods, um, they can be over, you can override the default implementation and add your, and as well as add your own method definitions. So here, if I didn't like the way the two string was by default, which is just using the square bracket, and then it just prints out each of the different field names, maybe I wanted something that printed out more nicely, I could just override two string. Um, of course, also, maybe I wanted something that would automatically generate um, JSON. So I added a two JSON method. Um, you could do that as well. Fundamentally, these are just classes, um, though they do have some specific constraints to them as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sealed class or uh, records can't um, extend any other method or any other class, but they can implement interfaces. And so if you wanted to do sealed, like you wanted to have like a sealed hierarchy with a class, you could accomplish it accomplish that with the interface in this example with a sealed interface user um, and then each of my different like admin guest and customer records all implement user as well and as you notice like i said i don't have a um, permits clause in here um, and that's because in this little example like these are all within the same source file so i wouldn't need a permits clause uh, the last new um, sort of a language feature I want to talk about is code snippets in Java API documentation. Uh, and so what code snippets, they're useful. Um, it is an improvement upon how to um, provide code samples within Javadoc. Uh, before we had the, the, the code tag, however, within Javadoc, that was just all considered text. It was just rendered as like code, you know, courier instead of just like standard um, whatever Arial, Helvetica, or whatever they're using. Um, 
it, it but it was only just generated as text. As a result, then it couldn't really be validated. Um, and there's also limits. You can also really highlight anything either. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. So, so now there is a new snippet tag where uh, this is actually, you can, well, it's not natively done by the Java doc. This is um, code that is transversible by the uh, Java compiler. So like third party libraries or third party tools could actually then validate this code to make sure it's correct Java code and maybe even check it against like some other area of the code as well to make sure that it would actually work correctly. Um, you can also reference external files as well if you wanted to. And there's also additional tags as well for like highlighting code or replacing values in code, the code examples as well. Um, so it, it's just about kind of helping to make sure um, your code examples can be a bit better and a bit um, also validated. Um, so yeah, if, let me know if you have any questions about any of the language features. Uh, but with that, we're going to get into some of the new runtime features and improvements. So the first I want to cover is class data sharing. Class data sharing is actually something that I don't know if someone wants to mention if they're actually using class data sharing or heard about it before. Uh, definitely let me know because I'm I'm very interested. But I think it's a very under-discussed feature within Java. Uh, and what this is, it actually goes all the way back to JDK 5 days, where every time you start up your JVM, um, the JVM is going to load a bunch of classes off of the file system that it just needs to, to run, you know, like, you know, uh, string and object and, and, and thread, like all that stuff. It needs to kind of load that off of the file system. So in JDK 5, they developed class data sharing to where a pre-processed archive file that has like all these classes that the JVM needs to start up can just be written read, read from as well. And this could also be memory mapped to where if you had multiple JVM processes running on the same host, they can all reference the same archive file, which can save memory then. Then in JDK 10, um, they extended this to where it could also be applied to um, application classes because when it was just the core Java classes, you know, there was some savings, um, but it wouldn't be too much. It would be only a few milliseconds. And so for any sort of complex application, like you would be running, writing in any sort of, you know, organizational setting, you wouldn't really notice a huge amount of benefit. After yes, application class data sharing allowed that ability to be applied um, to your more complex applications. So you can actually scale that more benefit more significantly. So JDK 13 made this process even easier to where to create a shared archive <coughs> before um, JDK 13 was about three step process. Now it's a two step process um, to where you start up your application one time and you include the JVM argument archive classes and exit. And then you provide the name of that shared archive. And then you just do the rest of like how you wanted to start up your application. You run your application and then you can just kill it. And then the JVM would take the information from the loading up and running the application and create a shared archive. On the next startup, then you would just say, you would use the JVM um, argument shared archive file. And then again, the name of the archive you just created to start the application. You know, it varies. Um, when I'm running this example on my local machine, when I'm not having like a presentation and Zoom and all that running, um, I use like the, there's a Spring Boot Pet Clinic proof of concept application, which is a simple application the Spring team has put together to demonstrate Spring Boot. Um, and usually on my machine, which is a 2018 MacBook, which is still like the Intel, it sometimes takes around maybe about five seconds to start the application up. Uh, but when I'm using app CDS, it takes usually maybe about four to four and a half seconds. So you can see maybe like a 10 to 20% improvement in startup. But of course, your mileage may vary. Um, if during startup, you're connected to a database or some sort of external service, that's going to take up a lot of your startup time. So you won't maybe see as much of a benefit of app CDS, but you would still see some sort of benefit. And of course, it would be very beneficial if you're trying to do um, 
uh, like uh, serverless functions or anything like that, where like you really need to have a fast startup, um, it's definitely worth checking out. And of course, if you're running multiple processes on the same system, um, you would actually know it's a pretty significant memory savings, but that can only that would only apply if you're running multiple process on the same system. Um, two last things on AppCDS is in JDK 19, they're creating a new argument to where um, it will automatically generate an archive, but that archive doesn't exist. And if that archive does exist, then it will just read from it. So your commands could become even easier to work with um, to where you won't need two separate commands. It can just do it all as one. And the other thing is, so when you're writing and deploying your applications, you know, we spend a lot of time working on them so we can maybe get the idea that most of the code that we're writing out there is a code that we wrote in yourselves. But really, that's not the case. Like, again, if you're running Spring Boot applications or Quarkus or, my, my, or uh, MicroProfile or any of those kind of um, different applications, most of the code that's actually running out there is the underlying dependency code from like the frameworks and all the libraries are being brought in. So if you're using a common tech stack within your team, organization, or, or whatever, uh, you don't necessarily need to go out and create a new shared archive for each individual application. The way the AppCDS would work is it would just load the classes that actually match from what it needs. And if it needs to go and fall back and load from the file system, then it will just do that. So really, like I said, if you're just using Spring Boot throughout your organization um, or throughout your team or whatever kind of you know domain group makes sense for you, um, you can just share that same archive across them. You don't necessarily need to create a new shared archive for each application. Not that it's really that difficult, but if you just don't want to have to have that maintenance hazard of constantly keeping them up all to date, you can really just kind of get away with just sharing the same archive across multiple applications as long as the underlying tech stack um, is the same or are very, very similar. Um, the other, so... Moving past uh, CDS, um, there was a new garbage collector that has been added to the JDK. Um, in this case, this is ZGC, or well, really Z, and Z doesn't actually stand for anything. It the Z was just a destination chosen because I, I don't know, I guess the garbage collector people just really thought that was uh, quite interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. But ZDC is a from scratch redesign of garbage collections on Java. Currently, it's a single generation garbage collector, which if you're really into garbage collectors, means something. If you're not, eh, just don't worry about it. <coughs> but if you are interested in that area, it is eventually, it is planned to make it a multi-generation garbage collector like Parallel or G1, um, you know, it, it's something that's in process. I don't know exactly when the idea is on delivering it, um, not like JDK 19 or anything like that, but I do know that is the plan. Um, but the goals of Z was to be both extremely low latency. So right now it's now to target it to less than one millisecond pause times and to also be extremely scalable. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so that makes it really ideal for the use within um, web applications where you want to have as little as um, response time when working with um, your with external clients. Uh, you know, so uh, garbage collection design and stuff is all about trade-offs. So maybe that lower latency does maybe come at a small trade-off when it comes to overall throughput. I, I haven't done any specific testing, but there is always got kind of trade-off and that could be one of them, but definitely check it out uh, to turn on GDC. Like it's fully production now. It's not like considered experimental anymore. Um, this you do just do the JVM argument use plus use GDC, such a heap size. And then you would maybe want to also turn on um, uh, verbose GC logging just to kind of really see what's happening within your application. But it's definitely worth checking out again, particularly if you're kind of doing web applications, that low latency pause time could have some real benefits. Uh, 
uh, the next one I want to talk about is helpful null pointers. And I think this is one going to be a very much a cloud freezer um, to all Java developers because, you know, raise your hand if you've ever run into a null pointer, which I'm guessing if you are in person, everyone would raise their hands because we've all ran into a null pointer and it's always annoying because we get that null pointer in the, in the logs and then it usually requires two production deploys because like we have it on a line where it could be like one of like three or seven, three or different, three or four different variables that could be null. And so we first have to like do some sort of debug statement to find out maybe what is really being null and deploy that to production, find out what is causing that null and then put some sort of fix in and then actually deploy that out. Helpful null pointers make this much easier to where um, now instead of just saying, oh, it, it, null pointer exception occurred on line seven, now it will actually say what variable was actually causing the null, um, the NPE to be thrown, now reducing the need for like that second deploy or just making the debugging process, you know, just that much easier. Uh, also, uh, with going on with the runtime improvements, uh, uh, ARM Architecture 64 support uh, is now on all of the different operating systems. And of course, now, you know, it's all there. And uh, uh, improving that support is just going to be an ongoing process. Like with every release, um, there's more updates and changes and improvements being done to um, ARM Architecture 64 support. Um, so, you know, it will continue to improve over time, but yeah, Mac OS was the last to get that support with JDK 17, Windows is just before JDK 16, Linux all the way back in JDK 9. Um, uh, but yeah, if you have one of those really cool, um, M1 MacBooks, uh, first to send it to me, but, uh, yeah, you should know it's a pretty nice improvement in your performance for your Java applications. Added in JDK 18 was the simple web server. And so this was kind of something that was asked for mostly in the academic area, but it would have also uses as well, wherein an easy way to be able to um, serve up static files, because this is often something that's an uh, early um, lesson when it comes to new Java developers in, in school of trying to serve up static files. And before this would always require like going out and downloading some sort of application server or maybe downloading another um, development kit like Python had one within it. But now we have the um, JWeb server and simply by just typing in JWeb server <clears throat> from that current directory, it will um, start running a, a, a server at um, the loopback address on port 8000. <coughs> And it will serve the files from the current directory where you ran JWeb server in. My types are automatically configured. So if there's an HTML file, it'll be rendered as HTML. A Java file would be just text plain, but that's also configurable as well. Um, the simple web server is only HTTP. There is no HTTPS, which again is another signal that it is a uh, test um, tool, not something to be used in production. All right, sorry about that. Um, you can also customize it though somewhat. You can change the port it's running on with the dash p with the dash p argument, the binding address, the directory. Um, this can be a remote directory, but you also need to provide the full path to the directory. <coughs> um, you can also change the output for it as well. Um, also, of course, with every release of the JDK, there's going to be some performance improvements as well. And there's pretty significant performance improvements between JDK 8 and JDK 17. So as I talked about before, um, with Spring Boot Pet Clinic, I just, again, this is running on my local machine. Your mileage may vary. You know, there's, there's always going to be a lot of variables, but just to kind of give a very baseline idea, um, starting the application up, uh, and this is all also compiled with JDK 8. So that's also another thing maybe that's 
not often realized is you don't necessarily need to recompile your applications to run it on a newer version of the JDK. Um, you can actually take the same binaries and still get a lot of these performance improvements. Like even like, for example, the helpful null pointer errors, you don't have to recompile your code to get that benefit. Um, even code compiled in JDK 8 uh, would get the helpful null point errors if running then in JDK 17. But all the same, so I just went out um, and got the Spring Boot Play Kinetic app from GitHub, and I built it with JDK 8. And, you know, it took about five and a quarter seconds to start up on my machine, and it went out and grabbed about 673 megabytes of, of heap space, of memory. Um, doing nothing else, I just started it up on JDK 17, and it took a little under five seconds to start up, um, and it was using way less memory. Um, and then with, again, with JDK 18, um, it took only about it took a little bit less time though also used a little bit more memory so i was kind of surprised by that so i was thinking it should have been less memory um so i'm not sure why there it was using a bit more of course that's again sometimes sometimes what happens with just running really simple tests on your local machine but all the same like i said uh, performance improvements happen every time and again this is just a simple test of just just simply starting it up and, and not really doing anything else uh, to get into some deprecation removals and other changes to know about. <coughs> um, so for deprecations, uh, there's Security Manager and the Applet API. And these are appropriately kind of sewn together. So hearing the Security Manager is being deprecated and actually deprecated for removal, um, it might kind of, you know, maybe set up some alarm bell saying like, oh, no, Java is becoming less secure. Um, however, the security manager is rarely used just because <clears throat> while it does do its attended purpose of making sure Java is more secure, our applications runtimes are more secure by doing, you know, configuring whatever you told it to do. It's often very difficult to use, and oftentimes the same behaviors can be accomplished more easily at the um, operating system level. And the primary reason why the security manager was assigned was for a time when Java applets were being actively used, where you would bring in this external code into your live running JVNF application to run it. Of course, that could be a huge security risk. So you would want to have your security manager set up in this case to say, okay, only these packages have access to doing these things. So when this other applet comes in, like it can't all of a sudden start writing to your operating system or making calls to networks or anything like that. You can use the security manager to um, uh, prevent that kind of behavior from happening. But that's just not... <clears throat> Applets just aren't used anymore. And so when we're running our applications right now, it's all code that we compiled ourselves. Now, of course, you know, there's third party dependencies we're bringing in and there could be security issue, issues within it, but there's ways of better handling that with like static analysis than doing that with a dynamic tool like Security Manager. So yeah, it's being removed just because, again, you know, like in your own application code where there might be features or things that just aren't being used. And of course, there's a, a cost and maintenance of supporting them. There's a maintenance cost in supporting the security manager. And because this is not being used that much, it is being deprecated for removal. That said, um, we're always interested in having um, feedback from the community. If there is some sort of APIs within a security manager that you're still using that maybe still have uh, meaning and use outside of the context of security manager, let us know. Cause I do know, for example, um, the, at Uber, um, there was some sort of testing going on to where they're using the security manager for something within that testing. It's been about six months since I read this article, uh, but it was like, oh, okay, that actually would have maybe valid use outside of security manager, that API that they were using. So like I said, if, if there is something maybe using, just let us know. Um, because like how some of this stuff will go forward, you know, um, it's still a lot to be determined. So like I said, we're always interested in feedback is fundamentally what I'm trying to get to. Um, things that have been actually removed from the JDK is Nashorn, the JavaScript engine. However, while it's no longer packaged as part of the JDK, <clears throat> it is still actually out there on GitHub and is still, it's not being as 
support it as it was when it was part of the JDK, but there, there is still some ongoing support for Nashorn. So if you still need it for some reason, or you're still interested in it, um, you can still definitely check that out under OpenJDK Nashorn or just, you know, OpenJDK Nashorn GitHub will get you to that GitHub repository. Uh, and then also the CMS garbage collector. Um, fundamentally, G1 was designed as a replacement for the CMS garbage collector. G1 became the default garbage collector um, with, a, with JDK 9. And so now, we, because that was proven to success with JDK 14, CMS was just removed. Also, just a note, uh, Applet API was also deprecated with JDK 9, but now in JDK 17, it's been marked for removal. So it's actually going to be removed here at some point in the future, though, again, how soon, you know, that's also kind of up in the air. <clears throat> and then last thing for the other changes is... Um, also starting with JDK 9 with the introduction of the Java module system was also about more strongly encapsulating the JDK internals. Um, with, J with JDK 9 introduced the Java module system, but to kind of help ease that transition, um, initially the illegal access permit was a default um, JVM argument. So that way, it would allow uh, reflective access into a module that would from another module that wouldn't necessarily have access to it. With JDK 16, illegal access permit was no longer a default argument. And now in JDK 17, illegal access permit is now a no-op. Um, however, there are still some APIs like Sun, Misc, Unsafe that are still um, able to be reflected into, but um, now, if you do need to have some sort of um, access into a specific module or a library that you're using, a library that you're using, you would need to use an add opens or um, have an add opens in your jar ma manifest. And eventually, illegal access will be removed. So, if you try to pass that in as a JVM argument, then you'll just get a, a, a failed runtime error at startup. So I cover like a bunch of new language features, runtime features, and these deprecations and removals. Um, but something that I just don't have time to cover, <laughs> just because, you know, we'd be here for several hours, is that also um, with every release is that um, new methods, new classes are added. Like one of the best examples of, or you know, a couple of the best examples of that is with string and the stream classes. So like string has had a, bunch of new API added to it that can just make it for like uh, removing all the like um, white spaces to the left of the string or to the right of a string or improving formatting. There's a bunch of new um, API that's been added to string and also the stream API. There's been like new API added like uh, teeing, um, multi-map and things like that. Anyways, I don't have time to go through all of that. But if you go to the Java doc, um, the official JDK Java doc, there is a new um, a new tag that does then cover all the new modules, packages, classes, names, anything that new has been added um, between JDK 11 and then the current version of the JDK. Uh, actually, I need to update this because I initially did this when this was in early access. But of course, if you just do you know google official jdk 18 java doc uh it'll get you to it but there's just a new tab that does and so all the new classes and api that has been added all right let's get a little bit into the future um of course also keep in mind that you know of course how things with always go with software development things can change a little bit um so don't necessarily look at some of the syntax i'm going to show you and necessarily expect it to actually be the same actually i think for one thing yeah, pattern matching for switch. <laughs> I need to actually update this in this presentation because it's going to be a third preview um, for it um, that I haven't actually updated in this presentation yet. Uh, but pattern matching for switch is, like we talked about earlier with pattern matching for instance of, it's an interesting pattern matching to switch. And that's how we can see it here. In this case, the predicate is the case matching on the class of, uh, or matching on the type of integer. And then the pattern variable is then this i. And then just like how 
flow scoping would work where I is only in scope wherever the compiler definitely knows it to be um, um, uh, has been set. Um, it's only in scope to the right of this, the, of the arrow um, marker. So actually, if I wanted to, I could use the same variable I for all of these different cases and the compiler would be treating it like that would be all different um, instances of a variable. So that can be also very helpful. So you don't necessarily have to arbitrarily come up with like different variable labels uh, for, um, for when you're writing a switch. And that can be very helpful because what's also switch is introducing is ca called guard patterns. So here, like I have this triangle T and if it's greater than a hundred area, okay, that's like a large triangle. Um, but if it's an, if it's less than a hundred, then that's a small triangle, but like, I don't have to come up with like a new variable name um, for this. It, I can still use the same variable T for it because again, as far as the compiler is concerned, these are two variable instances. In this code example right here, um, I was, I wrote it based upon the second preview of guard pattern. Um, but in the third preview, instead the guard pattern of it, uh, if I wanted to do some sort of additional checking on that pattern variable, you would first indicate it with when um, and then the rest of whatever you wanted to check on that variable for. Um, right now with preview two, I could just do with an um, and or the and operator. So that's that's one of the changes that are here. So <laughs> that kind of just goes to show you just how some of this stuff can change even in a relatively, you know, about six months since I first wrote this presentation. Also pattern matching for switch does allow for handling null cases as well. So, you know, you don't necessarily, this isn't gonna necessarily change for default because if you did have null and you didn't want to handle it, you know, that would just give a null pointer exception. But if you did want to handle it specifically, um, you can now do that as well with pattern matching for switch. Um, but also I kind of talked about how with switch expressions, you're often gonna need a default case. If you're using a sealed hierarchy, um, it can actually read that sealed hierarchy and be like, oh, okay, I covered all the sub types possible with user. So that way I don't need a default case for it. And if I was to add a new, um, class to this or you know i just didn't cover them all that would result in a compiler error because it's no longer exhaustive <clears throat> uh actually i need to also update this uh because actually these are no longer part of the same um jep but record patterns and array patterns record patterns again record pattern matching for records is it will make it easier just to get down to um scan down to like maybe subtypes within our subfields within a record so here like i really only care about um like one specific field with called color within colored point which is part of rectangle which has two colored points within it and for like right now without record matching pattern matching like i have to do like okay is rectangle not null okay it's not null then get the rectangle or get like um one of the upper left color point out of it okay, if it's not null, then, you know, I will get color out of that colored point and then, you know, do my business logic with it. Um, with pattern matching, like instance of pattern matching, it also can handle null safety. So I don't have to do a null check, uh, but I can farther extend upon it by just saying like, okay, if it's instance of rectangle, then directly reference the fields within that rectangle and retrieve them that way to where I can eventually get it to where um, I can accomplish in the six or seven lines before all within this a single line um, to reference it. So it's cleaner. I don't have to worry about null bill or I don't have to worry about null because the pattern matching is happening, um, handling that as well. Um, somewhat similar also with array patterns is I can just directly reference um, a field within an array and are a element within an array. And then it also does handle like the null checking. So like, let's say um, this array, like I was like, it was only one item within the array. It wasn't two. Um, instead of like this getting like a, some sort of an exception because like it'd be like array out of bounds error. It just simply would fail to check um, instead. So that also is helpful as well. 
Um, and then, of course, array patterns could also work on multi multi-dimensional arrays. However, as I mentioned, um, record patterns and array patterns have been split up um, into separate JEPs. And I don't know the current status on record patterns or I don't know the current status on array patterns. Um, that may be happening sometime in the further future. Record patterns should hopefully be part of JDK 19, but they haven't officially been added yet to my knowledge. Um, I also need to update this now to JDK 19, but yeah, you can also get access to all these early access builds. And I would definitely recommend kind of incorporating them into your CI process um, just to see how they could work. You know, you, it could be good just to see, even you're on JDK 11, just get an idea of like how your applications could work with JDK 17 or JDK 18, just to make sure that they're still compatible or if you're running into any sort of issues. Um, and of course, also if you're like on JDK 17, just to make sure, you know, if you want to eventually maybe move to JDK 21 when it's released as a long-term support release, um, it can be good to continue to check to make sure that your, um, your application is still compatible and you're not running into any issues by kind of bringing in these early access builds and checking against them. And then, of course, we would love that feedback if your test suite was maybe running correctly with JDK 17, but then if you run it in 18 or 19 early access and you're hitting an issue, um, it would be good to know what that issue is and maybe get some feedback to maybe correct an issue within it. So with that said, um, also some code examples. Um, again, you can get to the slide deck for this um, at my GitHub. And also uh, maybe less of an issue, but I know many organizations and many developers are still maybe on JDK 8, and they're kind of wondering how to get beyond JDK 8 um, to 11 and 17 and beyond. Uh, and this is a really great article by now ex-Netflix engineer uh, where the team he was on, um, they were having like a real struggle getting beyond JDK 8. Like it was considered impossible to go from JDK 8 to JDK 11. Um, and he wrote an article about his experience of that. And fundamentally what it was is just really about updating your dependencies to get to um, the JDK 11 plus um, instances or examples of that. Sometimes I might mean having to move off a dependency because it's no longer supported, but really there's a benefit in that because you don't really want to be using dependencies that aren't that supported because oh, that could pose a security risk. Um, with that said, uh, thank you for coming and yeah, definitely feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask me any questions. Or of course also type into the chat as well.